So I wonder, by a, by a show of hands on our campuses, and if you're watching online from somewhere in the world, maybe just put it in the comments, but how many of us have ever gotten lost because somebody gave us bad directions? Now, I know all the men are like, that's the only reason I've ever been lost, right? <laughs> It doesn't happen much anymore, right? Because we all got something in our pockets that can get us pretty much anywhere we're going. But, but I remember back in the days when uh, Apple first put maps on the iPhone, I didn't really trust it. And so I, I was actually on the road speaking a lot in that season of my life. And so every time I had to go to a speaking engagement, what I would do is I would go on a, a website that was called MapQuest. I remember MapQuest. And what you'd do is you'd go on and you'd get directions like the airport to the speaking venue, and then it would give you out like turn by turn directions, and then I would print those out, and then I'd carry them with me, right? But then, then the iPhone started saying, hey, you don't need MapQuest, I got this. And for a couple, couple times, I, like, I took MapQuest, but I also used my, my iPhone, and it did okay. And so finally, I decided I was going to quit MapQuest cold turkey. And I wasn't going to do that before I left, and so I had a speaking engagement in, uh, in Pittsburgh. And so I flew to Pittsburgh, I got out, I got my phone, I was like, okay, here's the address, it's like 2121 South Street or something. And my phone's like, oh yeah, I got gotcha. you. Here's what you want to do, you're just going to head this direction. It's very confident. And, and I was like, okay, but I feel like I'm going in the wrong direction. Like, I feel like you're taking me into the heart of Pittsburgh, and I know this is on the outskirts, my phone was like, trust me, right? So like, okay, so I followed it, and I followed it, and I was like, I'm really getting into, like, downtown Pittsburgh. This just does not feel right. And all of a sudden, my phone was like, you have arrived at your destination. And, and I looked over, and there was, a, there was an abandoned building to my left, and there was an empty lot, an overgrown empty lot to my right. And I was like, I don't think so. And my phone was like, no, this is it. And, and I, I put the address in again, and I was like, you're already here. Look, I did it twice. I got you here twice. And I was just like, this cannot be right. And so I, I used my phone to call up MapQuest and I put in the exact same address and it was like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't want to be here. You want to be way over there. Super stressful because I was already late because I had to go through Chicago to get to Pittsburgh. And every time I go through Chicago, I get delayed. And so I was already running super late and I had really hoped that I was going to get to the venue in time to get a little bit of food because I hadn't had any food in a while. But, but now MapQuest is like, yeah, you're going to have to go all the way back and do this whole thing. And so I just barely got there, right? I barely got there. One of the most stressful speaking engagements ever. I basically walked in and they're like, hi, here's your mic. There's the stage. And I was like, dinner? No? Okay. Okay. But that's what happens when you trust somebody who gives you bad directions, right? You end up in places you don't want to be. Discouraged, disappointed, stressed. And if that's true when somebody gives you bad physical directions, how much more true is it when somebody gives you bad spiritual directions? What if somebody says, yeah, I, I can tell you how to get to heaven, but they're giving you bad directions. Or somebody says, I can, I can tell you how to live in a way where you can experience more of God's blessing, but they're giving you bad directions. Or they say, I, I know God's will for your life, but they're giving you bad directions. Maybe that's why Jesus said this. He said, uh, watch out for false prophets. If you want to follow along, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, 15. That's where we find that instruction from Jesus. And while you're turning you there, your way there, or maybe you're opening up the app so you can follow along with the notes, let's, just, let's talk about prophets for a second. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. And I find that a lot of people are kind of confused about prophets and prophecy. So let me try to cut through some of the confusion and tell you, here's what I think is the most helpful definition of, of what prophets do from a biblical perspective, okay? Basically, here's what happens. Prophets bring new revelations from from God to lead us to God, okay? Let me say that again. Prophets bring new revelations from God to lead us to God. Now, the reason I say new revelations is because prophets and teachers are different, okay? Prophets deal in new information from God, new revelations from God. Teachers deal in kind of old revelations, old information, and they explain it and they apply it. I, I'm not a prophet, I'm a teacher, my spiritual gift is to help people understand the words of the prophets written in Scripture and, and apply them to their lives today so that you can follow Jesus, become like him, and join him on mission in the world. So I'm, I'm kind of working with helping people understand, okay? So teachers help people understand, but, but prophets uncover new information. That's really what the word revelation means. It means something that's been uncovered or, or, or revealed. It actually has that Latin root to, to reveal something. I actually love the Greek way they talk about revelation it, it meant literally to, to take the lid off of something. Like imagine you go home and there's a really good smell and you go into the kitchen and you're like, what's going on there? And somebody takes the lid off. And like, that's, what, that's what I'm cooking, right? 
That, that's what revelation is. I mean, prophets basically go, let, let me show you what God's cooking up. It's going to be awesome. So, so prophets sort of uncover new revelation, and then teachers help you understand existing revelation. Or you can think of it like this. Uh, prophets expose new information, and teachers explain existing information about God and his will and what it looks like to live in a way that honors him and, and leads us to the life that God meant for us. So prophets and teachers are different things. Okay? Now, when people think about the new information that prophets bring, they, they naturally tend to think about future predictions. In fact, let's be honest, how many of us, when we hear the word prophet, kind of naturally think about them predicting the future, right? Because that's what prophets do, right? they predict. But that's actually not true according to Scripture. It does happen sometimes, but the reality is a lot of the work that we find of the prophets in the Bible is actually revealing information nobody knew about the present or even the past, Moses was a great prophet, but the most famous book Moses wrote is the book of Genesis, which is actually saying, here's what God did in the past to create the world that we live in, right? He's revealing new information about the past. And sometimes it's just about the present. There's a famous story where Jesus was, uh, he, was uh, he was by a well, and it was, it was late in the day. It was the middle of the day, and so it was really hot when people didn't come to the well, but a woman came to the well. And immediately, because she was coming at that time of day, we, we kind of know there's, there's something going on with this woman because she's not there with the rest of the community of women. She's been excluded. So there's something kind of in question about her. But she came to the well, and Jesus said, hey, I, I want to offer you living water. He said, whoever drinks from the water from this well is going to get thirsty again. But, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. In fact, he said, it'll become a spring in them that wells up to eternal life. He said, I want to give this to you. And she goes... I would like to have it, please. And he goes, okay, why don't you go call your husband and come back so I can give it to him too. And she goes, oh, hang on a second. She goes, I don't have a husband. And Jesus looked at her and he said, what you've just said is quite true. You don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the man you have now is not your husband which is a very gentle way of basically saying that she'd been playing fast and loose with God's rules for sexual intimacy. And that was why she was being excluded from the community. And what you notice is that when she, he said this to her, the, the woman looked at him, and then this is what she said about She said, sir, I can see that you are a, what's that word? Prophet. I can see that you're a prophet. Why? because he revealed new information about what was going to happen to her because he predicted the future? No. It's because he, he had supernatural information about her present and her past. We tend to think that prophets deal with future predictions, but the reality is that prophets often deal with things that are going on in the moment that they couldn't know or things that have gone on in the past they couldn't know except that God, who knows all things, has revealed some of the things that he knows to his prophets to share with us. That's what prophets are. Why does God give people this supernatural information to share with his people? Why did Jesus reveal what he knew about this woman's past and her present? Was it to condemn her? Was it to shame her? No, it was to lead her to God. It was to, to get her to pay attention to what he was offering. He, he revealed his knowledge of her sin so that she would pay attention to God's solution to her sin. That Jesus came to offer forgiveness. He, he came to say, hey, basically, listen, if you, if you trust me, your past doesn't define your future. If, if you put your trust in me, your, your present is not a prison. If, if you put your trust in me, your, your sin is not a death sentence. There, there's forgiveness, there's a new hope, and there's a new life to be lived with God as his child. The reason Jesus revealed what he knew about her past and her present was to lead her to God's solution to her sin. And that's what prophets always do, okay? They, they, they bring new revelations from God to lead us to God. Of course, the natural question people ask after that is, okay, but are there still prophets? Where, where do we meet prophets? Where, where do we find ourselves having to pay attention to what Jesus says here about watching out for false prophets? Well, here's what I think. I think that we find true prophets in the Bible and sometimes in the church. I think we find true prophets in the Bible and sometimes we find them in church. We definitely find them in the Bible. 
I mean, the Bible is actually the words of prophets written down for us. Paul, when he's writing to his uh, protege, Timothy, said, uh, for all scripture is God-breathed. It literally comes from God. That's a prophetic concept. It's new information from God being delivered to his people. And so all of the Bible is actually the words of the prophets written down. And so when we read the Bible, we're encountering true prophets. But I actually believe, and this is a little bit of a hot take, a little controversial in some circles. I believe that we still find prophets in the church. I believe that the gift of prophecy is still in operation today. Now, again, not not everybody agrees with me. I got good friends who who think that I'm completely wrong about that, okay? There, There are people who believe that prophecy ceased to be a gift of the Spirit at some point in the past, and usually what they point to is they say, when the Bible was completed, once we had everything in Scripture that we needed to understand who God is and what it looks like to be saved by faith in Jesus, we didn't need prophets anymore, and so prophecy ceased. In fact, they often point to a, a passage where the Apostle Paul said this. He said, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. And Paul is clearly prophesying that there will be a day when prophecy goes away. It's not needed anymore. And they go, I think that was when the Bible was completed. And I totally understand where they're coming from. I just disagree. I don't think that's the day Paul was talking about. I think the day Paul was talking about was not the day when the Bible was finished, but the day we're all in the presence of God directly. And if we need some information from him, we can just be like, hey, God, got it. Okay, thanks. But we're not there yet. And so I still think prophecy may be in operation. Now, Let me be clear, I'm not a prophet, okay? And and I don't know that I've ever met a genuine prophet. I, I do think the gift of prophecy may be still in operation, but I also think that it's a pretty rare gift. I think it's always been a rare gift. And I think after the Bible was completed, there was less need for prophets. And so I think it's, it's an even more rare gift today. I don't think it's gone away, but I think it's a rare gift. But here's, here's what I know for sure, okay? Listen to this. Here's what I know for sure. I know that there have always been more false prophets than true prophets. There have always been more people who claim that they spoke for God, but they didn't come from God. There have always been more false prophets than true prophets. And that's why Jesus says, watch out. For false prophets. He says, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. I love that image. Because here's what happens. See, see, true prophets deliver, but false prophets devour. True prophets deliver. They deliver the word from God to lead people to God. So they deliver people who will listen to their word to the feet of Jesus. They deliver the word and they deliver people who follow the word to Jesus, to the life that God's intended for them, to to deeper faith. True prophets deliver, but but false prophets devour. They're, they're, They're constantly consuming. And people who follow them find themselves in places where they're disappointed and discouraged and depleted and hungry for the very things that the prophets said they could deliver, but they find themselves in the wilderness going, there's no food here. And, and there are whole religions founded on the words of false prophets. There are literally hundreds and thousands and millions of people who are in that wilderness place today because of the words of false prophets. Listen, I, I don't say this to, to be judgmental or, or harsh. I mean, anybody who's been listening to me teach for any length of time knows that's just not the spirit that God's put in me. But, but I also have to speak the truth. I have nothing but love and concern for the Islamic people. And if for some reason you're a follower of Muhammad, if you're a Muslim and you're listening to this, I just want you to understand, I care about you. Nothing but love and concern for you. But the evidence is clear that Muhammad was a false prophet. I have nothing but love in concern for people that are connected to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the the Mormons. But the evidence is clear that Joseph Smith was a false prophet. Nothing but love and concern for those that, that are connected to the Jehovah's Witnesses movement, but the evidence is so clear. Charles Russell was a false prophet. And if you find yourself in this place where you're like, I'm trying to follow the words of this leader that I've been listening to and the church that he founded, and and I find myself discouraged 
and disappointed and depleted and hungry. It's because it's not a true prophet you're following. And again, there's no judgment in that. It's, it's out of care and concern that I say it. True prophets deliver, but false prophets devour. So Jesus says, you got to watch out. you got to listen to true prophets, but you got to look out for the false ones. And he says, here's how you do it. So you stay on your guard. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, and thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. I want you to pay attention to what he says here. He says, the way you recognize a false prophet is not by how they make you feel. It's not by how attracted you are to what they say. It's by what they produce, right? And this is so important because a lot of times as Christians, we kind of make our decisions about who we're going to listen to and what we're going to believe based on kind of how we perceive it and, and how it feels to us. I, I taught something a couple years ago, and, and afterwards I, I got an email from somebody who said, yeah, I, I, I disagree with what you taught this weekend. I was like, okay, I, I could be wrong. I gave you my biblical argument for it. What's your biblical argument? Show me that I'm wrong. And, and this person goes, I, I just don't like it. Like, I don't know what to do with that. I, I could very well be wrong. Show, show me the argument. But, but it was just the perception. I, I like this other thing. I don't really like what you're saying. I'm like, that, that's not how you make decisions. How we perceive things is not how we make decisions. Because a lot of times our perceptions are wrong, right? I, I love that he uses the tree and fruit analogy here because I'm, I'm a semi-professional woodworker. And so I'm fairly familiar with woods. But let me be honest with you. If I look at a tree, I'm usually kind of lost. Let's see about you. Can we, we had a tree up here? There we go. Okay. There you go. How many would say, I'm going to give you a multiple choice. How many would say that's probably an apple tree? No takers on apple tree. Okay. How many would say maybe it's a pear tree? A couple pear tree. Okay. Maybe it's a uh, cherry tree. Maybe it's a walnut tree. Got a lot of uncertainty. Okay. Let's, let's, let's see some of the fruit. What is it? It's a pear. All right, let's try it again. Here's another tree, okay? How many would say that's, uh, that's an apple tree? Okay, pear tree again? Good, good, no takers on that one, good. Cherry tree? Walnut tree? What is it with walnuts? <laughs> it was like, yeah, it's a walnut. Here, here's, here's the fruit. It's cherry. Now, here, here's what I want you to pay attention to. When you saw the tree, when you perceived the tree, there wasn't a lot of confidence, was there? But when you saw the fruit, immediately everybody's like, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm on board. I, I'm, I'm good, right? Because the fruit makes it clear. Here's what Jesus is saying, okay? What Jesus is saying is that what we perceive is not as good a guide as what they produce. You hear me? What we perceive about someone or something and what they teach is not as reliable guide as what they produce. And so we have to look at what they produce. We have to look at their fruit. Now, now the Bible gives us at least five fruits of false prophets that we need to pay attention to, okay? Five fruits of false prophets to, to look out through. Number one is failed predictions, Prophets don't only predict the future, but it's interesting how many false prophets, that's the primary thing they're dealing with because that's the one that's harder to prove until the prediction comes, right? If they say, well, this happened in the past, this happened in the present, a lot of people can be like, no, it didn't, and you're a false prophet. But if it's the future, who knows, right? But, but here's what God says. He says, if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken, in other words, God's like, I got a 100% track record. I know the future, and if I'm telling somebody to tell you what's going to happen, they're going to get it right. So if they tell you God told me to tell you this is going to happen, it doesn't happen, I didn't say it, right? 
And listen, here's the thing. If somebody tells you what's gonna happen, when it's gonna happen, and when they said it's gonna happen, it doesn't happen, you can just stop listening to them. And now you're like, you had to go to seminary to get that, did you? And that's some deep truth there, pastor, right? And, and I say it, and it seems, it's like duh theology, right? But, but here's the thing, that there are all kinds of self-proclaimed prophets who are like, Jesus is coming back on this date next year, and then the date comes, and Jesus doesn't come, and the next Sunday, their churches are still full. Why is that? Well, like, oh, I forgot to carry the one. It's actually going to be in October. God says, listen, if they say it's going to happen and it doesn't happen, you're done. Failed predictions is one of them. A, a second fruit of false prophets is false gods. They, they lead you to follow somebody other than the God of the Bible. Moses, a prophet, said this. He says, if a prophet, a one who foretells by dreams, appears among you and announces to you a sign and a wonder, and the, if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place... Pay attention here. He basically says, sometimes prophets show up and and they claim to be able to do something supernatural and something supernatural happens. They know something they they maybe shouldn't have known or, or, you know, they, they, they do a miracle. There's a healing or something like that. Because here's the thing. There are other supernatural powers besides the God of the Bible. There are fallen angels, there are demons, and there are counterfeit miracles. He says, even if they proclaim a miracle and they they accomplish the miracle, he says, but if the prophet says, let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. It doesn't matter if they got supernatural power. If they're leading you to something other than the God of Scripture, they're not a prophet of the Lord. This happens all the time. I was, I was just in Africa last week, and I was talking to some of the pastors there, and they said, we have a big problem here, and it, it, they call it the prosperity gospel movement. It's people, people basically going, you know, listen, I can do signs and wonders, self-proclaimed prophets, and, and if you follow me, you know, you're going to have a big house, and you're going to have a full bank account, you're going to have a beautiful wife and perfect kids and all these kinds of things. Your life's going to be awesome. And listen, what they're doing is they're leading them to the God of money, the God of privilege, the God of power. It's not the God of the Bible. Another fruit of false prophets is hypocrisy. Prophet Jeremiah said, and among the prophets of Jerusalem, I've seen something horrible. They commit adultery and they live a lie. They're hypocrites. They they, they, they claim to be one thing, to lead people to holiness, but behind the scenes, that's not who they are. It's not what their lives are. And listen, this is, this is kind of a, a, a difficult thing, but I, I've got friends in the, in the more charismatic and Pentecostal side of Christianity, and I love them. I love the charismatic and Pentecostal side of Christianity. I've learned a lot from them over the years, especially about worship. But, but one of the struggles in that side of Christianity, and it's not like we don't have struggles on the more less charismatic Pentecostal, but, but one of their struggles is that so many of their self-proclaimed leaders and prophets end up having all these revelations made, not, not from God, but revelations in the news, revelations, people in their personal lives begin to say, hey, behind the scenes, he was cheating on his wife, he was stealing from the church, all these things are happening. So often, the, the, sometimes these people die, and then the word comes out that we didn't want to say anything before, we were a little bit scared, but this and this and this and this happened. Hypocrisy. Now, I want to be clear, that's not always the case. One of the guys that I do wonder if maybe has been a, a genuine prophet in the modern era is a man named John Wimber. He was the, the founder of the Vineyard Movement of Churches. And, and he, he might have been a prophet. He, he tells stories, and I, I've, I know people who know him who tell some of the stories. Like one time he was on a plane next to a guy, and he sat down, and he, and he looked over to, to greet him, and he looked at the guy, and he saw the word adultery written on his forehead. And so he, he leaned over to the guy. He goes, I just want you to know that I know because God told me that you're cheating on your wife. Can you imagine? Well, the guy was cheating on his wife. And, and John led him to Jesus there on the flight before it landed. And I go, that, that sounds like prophecy. And here's what I, what I love about John. He, he died back in the 90s, and, and nobody came forward and said, I need to tell you the true story. There, there were no revelations of improprieties or any of that kind of thing. In fact, the people that I know that knew him, they go, I, 
I think he was the real deal. He was a genuine, humble man of God. Now, listen, I don't necessarily agree with all of the vineyard teaching, okay? I'm, I'm not a vineyard pastor. We have some differences of theology, but I consider them brothers in Christ. But, but I do wonder if maybe John was a genuine prophet because there was no hypocrisy in his life. And Jeremiah says hypocrisy comes out pretty quick when false prophets are in operation. There's another fruit of false prophets, and that's a failure to confront Jeremiah goes on, he says, they strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They strengthen the hands. In other words, not only did they not call out sin, but, but they allow people to continue and maybe even justify it and continue down that road. Years ago, somebody told me that the job of a Christian leader, whether he's a preacher or a prophet, is to, to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. By the way, if you ever wonder why I feel like, like I'm just preaching at you, and if maybe it feels like I've started to meddle a little bit, I'm just trying to follow this advice. Yeah, if you're afflicted, I want to bring you some comfort, but if you've gotten comfortable, and you're not taking your next step of obedience, your next step of following Jesus and joining him on mission, I, I, need, I, I need to get you a little uncomfortable. I need to afflict you just a little bit to get you moving, but he says, false prophets and false preachers, they don't, they don't do that. And the reason for that, I think, is because of the fifth fruit of false prophets, and that is they're self-serving. They're kind of in it for them. They're not there to lead people to God. They're there to build their audiences. They're not there to feed the flock. They're there to fleece the flock, right? To get money and power and prestige out of them. And that's why they're not going to challenge anybody. As long as you're following, as long as you're giving, I'm not going to make you uncomfortable because I'm saying you're not following God's way of doing life. It's because they're self-serving. Bottom line, Jesus says, listen, if you want to stay close to Jesus, don't get your directions from bad guides. Right? It's not rocket science. If you want to stay close to Jesus, if you want to live a life that honors God and a life that allows you to begin to experience, even here in a fallen world, the, the ability to begin to experience more of life the way God intended it, then you need to make sure you're not getting your directions from bad guides. So what, what do we do with that? Let me give you two big ideas. One of them is, if you want to make sure that you're not getting your directions from bad guides, it's really helpful if you know the destination. Okay? Because the thing is, like, a lot of these fruits take some time to come out. And, and so, I, I don't know about you, but I want a quicker way of assessing whether or not somebody is likely a, a true or a false prophet or a true or a false teacher, okay? And, and, and fruit takes time, but here's the thing, if you know the destination, it's going to be a lot easier to judge the directions they're giving you. I mean, if, if you say to somebody, hey, I need to get from Colorado to California, and they go, okay, first thing you need to do, head east. Like right away, you're going to be like, no, the first thing I need to do is talk to somebody else, right? Because <laughs> I know that California is to the west of Colorado. Now, you might not know the best way to get there. You might like, should I do I-70? Should I go down and do the, you know, the Route 66 thing? What's the, what's the best way to do it? And they might be able to give you some ideas. But if their first direction doesn't take you to the destination, you know there's something wrong with their direction-giving abilities. One of the best ways to judge is to know the destination. Here's four ways you can do that. Number one, read the Bible for yourself. Look, not every Christian throughout history has had that opportunity. There are Christians in the world today that don't have that opportunity, but read the Bible for yourself. Get familiar with the words of true prophets. It's going to be a lot easier to recognize the words of false ones. Learn from trusted teachers. It's another way to do it. Learn from trusted teachers. I hope that I am one of those. I believe that I'm one of those. But I also know there are a lot of great teachers. There are teachers I learn from. And, and, and the more that I learn from, from God-gifted teachers, the better I am, I am able to discern when I hear something that's just not true. Another thing you can do is you can apply the Bible in your life. Don't, don't, just, don't just read it. Don't just take in information, but seek transformation, which comes from obedience. Discipleship is about the next step of obedience, not the next step of, of information. It's the next step of obedience. So when you hear a message, when you, when you read the Bible, and you're like, I need to do something about it, do something about it. What's going to happen is you're going to get more and more familiar with truth, which makes it so much easier to recognize lies. Another thing you can do is surround yourself with fellow travelers. 
Get other people that are trying to become like Jesus and join him on mission, and, and, and you help each other in this. That's why we think groups are so important. Because sometimes I recognize in the life of a friend, hey, you know, I think you might be listening to some teaching that's off. And sometimes they do the same thing for me. I have people that I reach out to and I go, what do you think about this? And, and they give me wisdom. We, we do this together. Know the destination. And it's going to be so much easier to recognize when somebody's given you bad direction. And there's one other thing I want to challenge you with today. I want to afflict you with today. Because I think maybe we get a little too comfortable with something. So buckle up. You love me? You're like, we're going to wait till we hear what you got to say, right? <laughs> Here's something that I really believe that I need to share with you today, okay? If, if we're going to follow Jesus' instruction to watch out for false prophets, I think partly that means that we need to watch out that we don't become false prophets. So so here's the other big idea for you. Don't be a false prophet. And I know most people are like, I would never do that. But the truth is we do it all the time. Think about it like this. True prophecy is when God puts his words in your mouth, right? That's true prophecy. False prophecy is whenever we put our words in his mouth. And we do that all the time. We do it with parenting styles. Here's how you got to raise your kids. Here's how God wants you to raise your kids. Right? By the way, do we have any new parents with us today? Yeah, I see some. some okay, Here, here's the thing. Just a little clue for new parents. I tell all new parents this. You need to understand that when your parents come to visit you as a new parent, they're partly there to see their grandkids. They're also partly there to defend how they raised you. Okay. <laughs> And sometimes it goes to extremes to the point that like how we felt like we needed to raise our kids is that's God's way to do it. In fact, there was a a curriculum back when our kids were little. It was called Growing Kids God's Way. And it had some good biblical stuff. It also had a bunch of, I I would say, debatable parenting advice that there's nothing about God there. It's just that maybe that's what worked with your kids. But here's what I figured out is that I had two very different kids. What worked with my oldest daughter was not necessarily what worked with my youngest daughter. And so we had slightly different approaches. And and I think that's probably true for different people's kids too. And yeah, the Bible gives us principles we need to follow. There's there's boundaries we keep our parenting in. But I think there's some, some latitude in there. And when we begin to go, well, this is what I did. So this is what God wants you to do. I think you may be getting to that place where you're starting to put some of your words in God's mouth. It can happen with how we school our kids, right? Listen, I homeschooled our girls up until high school. But I was a youth pastor, and sometimes homeschool kids were the worst. Now, I love homeschool kids. Actually, what, what, I, what I struggle with in a homeschool families was the parents going, you cannot follow Jesus and put your kids in a public school. Where, where was that? Is that one? Is that one? But I had the other extreme, too. I had people going, hey, you cannot really love Jesus and take your kids out of the public school. Because we're supposed to be salt and light. We're supposed to be making a difference in the world. And if you're taking the kids out of the public school, then, then you don't really care about what Jesus said about reaching the nations. And then other people were like, no, no, if you really love Jesus, you got to send them to private school. And I was like, well, what if you're broke? <laughs> it can happen with the, the way we dress. Right, I, Danny, our, our uh, executive over a weekend experience here, one of our worship leaders, he, he tells a story about being in South Carolina and he was leading some worship and a woman came up to him and said, you cannot sing about God's word and wear jeans. <laughs> really? Again, where, where, where? This may be missing a chapter or something. I just can't find that one. We can do it with uh, the way we connect with God. Look, different people connect with God in different ways. My wife really connects with God powerfully in corporate, worship, in corporate prayer. When, when people are together praying, she just experiences God in a powerful way. That's awesome. I, I don't. 
I believe corporate prayer is important. I, I practice it, but I'm gonna be honest, when I find myself in a, in a group setting praying, I find that I'm usually listening to what other people are saying, and then I'm, I'm kind of preparing what I'm gonna say, and then I'm kind of, I'm performing because there's other people listening, and I, it doesn't feel like genuine prayer for me. Now, that's not true for my wife, but it is a struggle for me. Again, I think it's important, I think we need to do it, but it's not a way that I connect with God in the same way that I do when I'm alone in my office reading theology books. And if you feel like I need to connect with God, what you need to do is get some theology books. <laughs> no. No, you need to find out how it is that you connect with God because God's wired us differently and, and we become false prophets the moment we go, what, what, what works for me and the way that God has wired me and what God has led me to is what God is leading everyone to. And if you don't do it, then you're not with Jesus. No, that's putting your words in God's mouth. I don't know if I dare say this one. It can happen with politics. Can we just be real about that? I've got good friends who are just really passionate Republicans. And sometimes they, they say, I've heard them say, they go, you, you cannot be a Christian and a Democrat. And, and the reason is primarily because they're, they're passionate about the abortion issue, as they should be. But I've got one friend, a close friend, who is a Democrat. And I've heard him say, I don't know how you can be a Christian and a Republican because he's passionate about the poor as he should be. He's got plenty of biblical precedent for that. But the moment you say you can't be a Republican and a Christian or you say you can't be a Democrat and a Christian, I'm like, how can you be a Christian and be so arrogant? Stop putting your words in God's mouth. Just recognize we've been wired differently. We have different passions and pursuits, and, and God blesses those. Yes, there are boundaries, and here's the thing. This is the, the hardest thing to get a grip on here, okay? We cannot refuse to say what God has said clearly. In fact, if God has said it clearly, we need to speak it boldly. I've, I've tried to model that a little bit today. But don't turn your personal preferences into God's commands for everybody. Don't, don't even turn your personal convictions, maybe God has convicted you of something, and, and you need to obey that leading of the Spirit, but, but don't judge every other Christian if they don't have that particular conviction, and, and it's about an issue that the Scripture doesn't speak about plainly. I mean, it, it happens with worship songs. It's funny, in the church, nobody ever doesn't like a worship song. It's always God doesn't like that worship song. That sounds suspiciously like false prophecy. Let me ask you this question. Is there a place that you're tempted to turn your preferences or, or even your convictions into God's commands? Again, please hear me. We need to speak boldly what God has said clearly. But he said enough clearly that we don't need to be adding a bunch of our own personal stuff into the message. Because Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. Don't listen to them. Don't become them. Don't put your words in God's mouth. Speak boldly what he has said clearly. But in other things, maybe, maybe adopt some humility because of the consequences against false prophets are not, they're not great. God, we're grateful for your word that we have scripture. And so we have the ability to, to judge, to discern so much that people might say is coming from you. And we have a lot to go on to be able to declare a lot of those things not of you. grateful you have always communicated what we need to know to move towards you to become like your son Jesus to join him on mission in the world as you've called us to we're grateful for your word and we ask that you help us take advantage of us teach us teach us to know you so well to know the destination that we are quick to recognize bad direction but Lord we also ask that you would you would guard us 
from becoming the people that we're told to guard against. Holy Spirit, we invite you even in this moment to speak to us about ways that we have turned our personal preferences and, and maybe even convictions that you've given us as individuals into a standard that we expect everyone to follow and we look down on them if they don't. And so we lack grace and humility and, and maybe we're moving into that territory where we're becoming the very people that Jesus tells us to watch out for. Lord, it's, it's not easy. There's a tension here. It's not a problem we solve. It's a tension that we manage. We have to say boldly what you have spoken clearly. But we don't need to add to your word. And Spirit, as you move among us and speak to us, I, I want to speak to, to those who are maybe listening to this message. And, and the reason you're not a follower of Jesus is because you've been hurt by people who are claiming to speak in the name of God, and yet what they've said or how they've said it just didn't quite ring true, and there's been damage and there's been hurt. And what I want to say to you is, why don't you think about the woman at the well? God speaks truth. He, he reveals sin, and, and sin is a real thing. It's a dangerous thing. Sin separates us from God, and, and if we don't deal with it, if we don't seek his solution to it, it separates us from God for all eternity, and that is a, that's a thing to be avoided at all costs. But God has provided a solution. He sent his son, Jesus, who died on the cross and then rose three days later to prove that he'd completed the mission. And he offers us forgiveness by trust, by faith. If you've never trusted in Jesus, then my hope is that your next step today is just to say yes to Jesus. Maybe even in this moment, you, you say something like this to God. Say, God, I've sinned and I'm sorry. I know that my sin is serious. I know it separates me from you. Thank you for chasing after me. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead, and I'm ready to put my faith in you. Jesus, I'm trusting you for forgiveness, for eternal life. Amen. Can we just celebrate what God's doing? Maybe God's convicting you in something, or maybe you've made the decision today to trust Jesus. And by the way, if you have made that decision today, would you let us know about it? Just text the word Jesus to 80875. Let us know you've made that decision. If you want, there'll be an opportunity there. Let us know where, and we'll send you some free materials, a free book we've written to help you begin experiencing this new life with this God of grace. But let's take a moment right now. Let's, let's all stand up. One of the ways that we hear from God is in corporate worship. And so let's take a moment to hear from God as we go out into a world that desperately needs to hear what he has said clearly, but they don't necessarily need to hear all the stuff that we've added to it.